Amen. Amen. All right. Here we're going to come into Titus this morning in chapter number 2 and verse number 13. Of course, we, we might as well back up. We're going to hit verse 11 also. So it's going to run off again. Okay, goodness. You have to let me know because I, I won't never see behind us. So let me hook that back up uh, this morning. Here we go. It should get it right there. All right. Yeah, now we back up on it. Okay, verse 11, chapter 2 of Titus. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation had appeared unto all men. What the Word of God teaches us, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we shall live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. This is a the world we live in. It is present, but there is a world to come. We've seen that over the last few weeks looking into the scripture, so keep that in mind. And as I was saying that if the godly doesn't live godly, I mean, what example are we to be other than that? We need to, the world needs to see the difference, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, and you know that, but it's still good to be reminded mm -hmm. of those things. Then he says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And so the title this morning would be, What Are You Looking For? We will find normally what we're looking for. Amen? But it's good to come and how busy we are. It's good for the Lord to give us a little wake-up call every now and then. Get us refocused on what we should be focused on, and that is Him. Now, whether we like it or not, He's coming one day. You what's the old saying? We used to play hide and seek, ready or not, here I come. And He's going to come one day. We don't. Now, I know there's been thousands and thousands of people, and we know preachers that have lived uh, over time and, and for hundreds of years and even thousands of years who thought the Lord would come in their lifetime. And you may say, well, I've been hearing that all my life. Well, one day he's going to come. And I don't know when it is, and you don't know when it is. And we'll see that later on as we uh, get into the study this morning. But he says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So what are you looking for? And that word looking for there, and starting in verse 13, is actually a combination of of two Greek words. It says the first one being a preposition of direction. In other words, it's the direction we're looking for. This thing's just it's fried this morning. I'm cutting it off. I'm, I'm tired of the devil distracting me this morning on that. Y'all can turn your Bibles to Titus 2. Amen. If that thing goes off, let it go off. That don't make no difference. But it comes from two Greek words. The first being a preposition of direction. And that means looking forward. You know, we have different prepositional phrases uh, in the Word of God. And of course, this one is like looking forward. It comes from a word to look toward or the side of the second meaning uh, to take hold of the, the hand to receive. So what Paul is doing is giving us a picture here of looking forward to the coming of the Lord, and also when we look forward that day, we'll be able to take him by the hand. You say, well, he's only got two hands. Let me tell you something. God's hands are big. Amen? Amen. Amen. God can hold us. And many times, I try to encourage people <clears throat> that as we look out and we're going through some trials, matter of fact, I, I text Brother Peter about 2.30 the other morning Cause I figured it'd be up anyway. You know how he is. He don't ever sleep. And so I just texted him and I said, God has got you. God has got you. And so God has got us in his hands. I remember when my former pastor who uh, led me to the Lord and groomed me and discipled me, I remember getting a call when he died, Brother Cloris Watson. And the only song that come in my head was a little child song. He's got the whole world in his hands. I needed that at that time. Mm -hmm. My heart was broke. But I know God's got the whole world in his hands. So it comes from that combination of taking 
hold by the hand in a prepositional direction looking forward to. So Paul is saying he's for us to anticipate for that blessed hope, that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Well, if we're not, if we're if we're doing what verse 12 says, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, and if we'll live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, then we are focusing on looking for the Lord. But if we are not living according to the Word of God, and we are chasing those worldly lusts, and we are living ungodly, and we're not living soberly, nor righteously, nor godly in this present world, we won't be looking for the Lord. We won't want Him to come during that time and find us asleep. So Paul's encouraging him to re uh, anticipate the return of the Lord Jesus. For him and us to be living in a state of anticipation. You see, I know he was writing to Titus. But he's also writing to us through the unction of the Holy Spirit. So if you want to take Titus out and put your name in there, I think that would be alright to do that. So we're to be looking, living the way we ought to be looking. So we ought to be looking, anticipating Him to return. Be living in that state of anticipation. And we can only get in that state, as I said a moment ago, when we take our eyes off of the world because it's easy to get burdened down with things of life and looking around at all things. Now, sometimes God just has to come along and sort of slap us a little bit. Grab us by the neck and shake us and wake us up. Say, I'm coming again. Get your focus back on me. And that's what we have to do. It happens to all of us. When we can uh, look forward to that day, we can take Him and can receive His coming. And by the hand, that's what we really need to be looking for. But I'm looking forward to that day He returns. And I know, praise the Lord, it could be today. It just could be. We hear it all the time, but it's going to happen one day. Well, it, it, it's just, I'll never forget I, <laughs> This guy said, well, uh, something about he's going to come in the brightness of the day. And I thought, well, you know, brother, it ain't always bright on one side of the world. That's he right. said, I ain't thought about that. I said, well, that's these little traditions you've just been caught up in about when he's going to return in the brightness or a cloudless day or something like that. He'll be the brightness. It, yeah, exactly right. He'll be. Well, it ain't going to be. It's dark right now in Thailand. That's right. <laughs> My brother who preached this morning is probably getting in the bed right now. So that's just the way it is. We, we have those kind of things. But God is going to return one of these days. And it's going to be so I'm going to turn over to Matthew this morning in, in chapter 24, and I know you're familiar with the passage. In Matthew 24, of course, they, they standing around and they're asking the Lord about signs of His coming and everything. And He says in verse 32, Now learn a parable of the fig tree when its branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. Now, there's changes of seasons all around. And again, some places we go on missions trips, it's only rainy season and dry season. Well, the seasons still change. And here, uh, we have different changes of season with going in. I have a little barometer of, a, of in my household of when times are changing. That's Lindsay. When she starts sniffling and getting sneezy and stopped up, I know the change of season's coming. That's just going to happen. Well, it's the same way. He said, you know when this uh, fig tree starts putting forth leaves, and you can look out right now, things are budding. It didn't feel like it Tuesday and Wednesday, but spring's here. Amen. It didn't feel like it at all. It's coming. And so the change of season is there. You can tell in the fall. The next thing you know around the end of August, something like it, a few leaves start falling off the trees and things of that nature. You know a change of season is nigh. He said in verse 33, So likewise ye, when you shall see all of these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Now think about time. You think about a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. I mean, you think about how a thousand years is like a day to him. 
he ain't been gone that long. Amen. Just a few days. Amen. <laughs> Since he give us this word right here. So his return is nice. It's not going to be long. He operates on his calendar. He said, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That's a promise we can have from the word of God. But of that day, now that's referring to that day that's going to come. That day will come. The day of the Lord will come. But of that day, and I will know if no man no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And see, and that's given into the hands of the Father. The Father hadn't released it. One day he will go to his son. Mm -hmm. He'll say, it's time. Yep. Go get him. Yep. Go get him. There ain't going to be no warning. There ain't going to be nothing like that. He's going to come and take us out just yep. like that. He said, verse 37, but, and he's supposed to explain the last day scenario to us and what the world's going to be like. As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Well, we are in the days of Noah, if it's ever been the time. Everybody, I ain't even got to explain it all to you. You know what's going on. Yeah in this world and what things are being pushed along toward us. He said in verse 39, And they knew not until the flood came and took them, the Bible says here, all the way. They didn't know it. They didn't realize it. They thought Noah was an idiot out here preaching for 120 years. And you know the story. You have a little 10-year-old kid and he's saying, Who is this man? Now this man, I said, oh, Daddy said, don't worry about that. This old crazy man talking about a flood came. It ain't never rained. Then another generation comes. Then another generation comes. Next thing you know, the Lord brought these animals through here. And then they got into the ark. And they still didn't know it until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be just like that. When a time you don't think he's coming. Yep. When the world's asleep. When the church is asleep. He's still going to come. And I tell you what. The church can go to sleep. Yep. Faith Baptist can go to sleep. Any church you want to name in that category. Can go to sleep. And many are asleep. Even though they, they doing like the disciples were. They was doing and walking with God. And they was fatigued. And they went to sleep. When that hour came, he said, the hour has come when the Son of Man is being traded in the hands of sinners. He went to wake him up three times. He finally said, just sleep on now. I'm going to do the work. He was headed to the cross. Then he says, there shall be two in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come but know this we don't know what hour but he says but know this that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come he would have watched and would not suffer his house to be broken up wouldn't you like I don't know if you've ever had anything stolen from you mm -hmm. or you ever had your house broken into I tell you what that is the craziest feeling of betrayal you can ever have mm -hmm. No, and I, I'll never forget, we was, we was coming here, and we drove for eight years from Morley. And somebody went in my garage while we was here at church and stole, I'm talking about saws and nail guns, and just loaded their self up. When I got back home and realized what had happened, I was... I was not upset <laughs> at all. <laughs> I, was, I couldn't have put my hands on nobody or nothing. I just went in there and said, praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, you know better than that. I felt violated. Yeah. You probably yeah. said all that stuff was already wore out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then I had to fight with insurance companies. All that, that battle was coming. See, one thing leads to another. Yeah. But the bottom line is, the person had been watching 
and yep. knowing what time I leave, every Sunday morning, knowing that man would be bagging out about 8 15, 8 30 to make it to church. Wouldn't be coming back home to 1 30, 2 o'clock. Yep. Knew it wouldn't be that. Watched and watched and watched. Now, had I known that was going to happen, you would have been there. I would have been there. I'd have let her leave in the van and I would have stayed at home. But I didn't know. That's what he's saying here. He said that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not suffered his house to be broken up. In the same manner here, therefore be you also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. He's going to catch us asleep. Mm -hmm. At all times, it's impossible to totally keep your mind on the coming of the right. Lord. It's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, we're getting a little, little refreshment and wake up this morning mm -hmm. in Sunday school, but we'll be far from thinking that in a little while. <laughs> we'll be practicing and doing whatever we're doing. He's coming when we think not. He said, who then is a faithful and a wise servant? who his Lord have made rule over his household to give meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Just doing what you're supposed to do. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him rule over his own goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, to eat and to drink when drunken, the Lord of, what, of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, in an hour when that he is not aware of. So we ought to look for and anticipate the coming of the Lord. Now, back in our text, that's what he's saying in Titus here. We'll get back to it. And two, looking for that blessed hope. Of course, that blessed hope is the supremely blessed. And he is. Amen. He is supremely blessed. And of course, hope not being something that the you old know, scripture says if we if we see something, what do we yet hope for? And hope maketh not a shame. Well, this hope is in like an anticipation. This is an assurance. This is a concrete confidence, having concretely confidence, solid, solid confidence. And James, right over here, says in chapter 5, in verse number 7, Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. James, I, I don't know, God just worked him over with patience, I guess. Mm -hmm. He says patience several times in the scriptures. And I, I just, but the older we get, the more patience we do have with the Lord. I mean, the more we know he's done brought us through so much, he's going to bring us through it again. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. He's fixing to give us an example. Behold the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth. He had long patience for it until he receives the early and the latter rain. Now, that's exactly what happens when we put something in the ground. That's all we can do, folks. <laughs> you know the scripture talks about one man soweth another reaping, but God gives increase. That's right. When we put seed in the ground, all we can do is wait for the early and the latter rain, the, the early rain to, to beat it on down in the earth, and for that seed to die, and then that moisture to make it come forth, and then the latter rain to, to really nutrients it. Well, that's what the idea of the coming of the Lord is being patient. He's going to come. Then he says in verse 8, Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. That means that it's nigh. His coming is nigh. It's close. It's closer than it was when we started in Sunday school a little while ago. Mm -hmm. Then he says, That glorious appearing. His appearing will be with dignity. It will be glorious, honor, praiseworthy. Worshipful. It's going to be fabulous, and that's what he's talking about. That glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And of course, Acts 1 8, we really got time to turn to these other scriptures I got written down, but in, in Acts 1 8, of course, you know, you shall receive power, and the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses. 
both in, in Jerusalem, Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth. He gets on down into verse 11. He talks about that after that in verse 10 that he ascended up. And he said, Why stand you here gazing up this same Jesus, which you saw a sin shall come in like manner. He's going to come back the same way. But the, the title there, the, the, what I want you to see is this same Jesus. Not another Jesus, not somebody else. It's going to be the same one. His coming draweth nigh. Of course, you know 1 Thessalonians 4.13. You hear it at every funeral you go to. But God said those that are with Him, He's going to bring, though when He comes back, He's going to bring them with Him. And of course, he says there, uh, let me just read it here. I would not have you to be ignorant, brother, concerning them which are asleep, that you saw not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. If he's going to bring them with him, where they at? They're with him. The absence of the body is to be present with the Lord. And he says, For this will say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain of the coming of the Lord shall not precede or prevent them which are asleep. And it is in verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. So there is going to be a glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Then he says he gave himself for us, that he might redeem us. And of course that means to release on receipt of a ransom. It's no different when we go to some place and we have to walk out of that place and we have items in our cart like Sam's or whatever, we have to show them a receipt. Well, we have redeemed them. Well, we have purchased them. Well, the Lord has His blood on us. Amen? He has redeemed us. This is Him that is coming. We ought to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world looking for that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, the same one who's coming after us the same one who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify in himself a peculiar people. And that is a people that is zealous under good works. Peculiar meaning beyond usual. <laughs> you know, anybody can be a, a, a sinner, a, a drunkard, a whoremonger. I mean, that's all I was before I got saved. No problem. You can be all that stuff. But can't everybody live godly? Mm -hmm. You've got to have the help of the Lord. That's why we are peculiar people. And we are zealous of good works. We've been washed in the blood. God has set us aside. And so we are to look in anticipation for that blessed assurance that is coming. Father, thank you for the blessings of this hour. Bless us as we worship you in spirit and truth in just a moment. In Jesus' name, amen.